Welcome to the third Baptism Sunday of Promise Church. Let's make some noise to the Lord, please. If you could all please be seated at this time. We would like to thank you so much for being here today. And a special thanks to those guests that are here to support your loved ones that are being baptized today. We want you to know that we think it's a huge deal that you would take time out of your Sunday and come and support and love on someone that might be getting baptized in your family or one of your friends today. My name is Pastor Reno, and I consider it a privilege and an honor of shepherding this little flock we call Promise Church. And I want to tell you, I'm really, really excited about what we are about to experience here today. Before we begin, I just want to extend many thanks to God for many blessings that we've been able to enjoy. And I'd like to just, first of all, just thank Community Fellowship Church. They have been just a huge help to us along our whole journey as a church plant. And they were able to borrow to us or lend us the baptismal for today. I'd like to put a special thanks out to those who are in Team Promise that have done a lot of work even weeks before to make this day happen. A special thanks to the hospitality team that's preparing food for over 120 people right now behind these walls, believe it or not. (laughs) And I'd like to thank the hospitality team for always making a sacrifice so that they can have Christ-like servanthood to serve all of you so that you can feel like family here today. That's our prayer. We would like to thank disciple makers, parents, grandparents, for the many prayers and the many tears that have come flowing down your eyes, wondering when their day would come. We'd like to thank Bridge Youth Group here at Promise Church, the preachers and the teachers that have partaken in investing in these young ones' lives so that they can come to the point that they are going to experience today, making their faith public. I'd like to thank Promise Kids Sunday School teachers, leaders, and Anna Rose for all the hard work that they all put in so that they can grow these kids up and train them up in the way they should go so that they could arrive to a certain point and understand that the soils of their heart have been rototilled to receive the seeds of heaven in Jesus Christ. We would like to thank spouses, cousins, friends, student leaders, Bible teachers. Thank you for the influence that you have had in leading these beloved to Jesus. We'd like to thank God for all of you, every single one of you that are here today, because this would be pretty boring if there was maybe two or five people in here, right? It'd still be great. It's a lot greater when a lot of people show up to the Super Bowl and we consider baptism like the Super Bowl even better, way better, a thousand times better, okay? So we thank God for all of you. And if you would just join me in giving a huge round of applause to the Lord, to the praise of his glory, for all of his provisions. If you would please just bow your heads with me so we can please pray for a moment. Father, it is to you and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit. That we proclaim, even now, your goodness to us. We adore you, O God. You have not only created us, but you've sustained us. You've given us the health that we need, the breath in our lungs, the blood in our veins, the ability to interact with friends, family, and enjoy all the wonderful things that we enjoy here on earth. We thank you, Lord, that you knew that we would need a rescue mission even before we did. We thank you. You send your son, Jesus, to come in and rescue people from their sins that separate us from you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for all the great stories that we are about to hear. Lord, we praise you now for what we are about to partake here. And as we transition to general prayer, I pray that your hand of blessing would be here on this baptismal Sunday. 
and that we would get truly a sense of wonder from heaven, a sense of heaven, praying as your son prayed. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So now, Lord, as we go into general prayer, I pray at this time that everyone who will be going on the Camp Nathaniel missions trip, would you please stand for a moment if you're here today, whether you're a leader or a student. Oh God, we pray for this team that will be leaving us next Sunday morning at five in the morning and coming back next Thursday as they go down to Camp Nathaniel in Kentucky and they go and serve that youth camp there, Lord, that the light of Christ will be able to shine even brighter through their efforts, through their work, through their interactions. I pray that their love tanks would be filled. They would, they would love one another. They'd, they'd come back feeling loved, not only by one another, but of course by you, Lord. I pray that your gospel would be preached with power there through the four different um, youth groups that will be represented there, Lord. I pray you'd give them travel mercies and safety as they drive that eight and a half hour drive in the car and everyone would um, just be unified with one voice, one mind, one heart, one vision in Christ, Lord. And I pray, God, that they would come back with testimonials that will just be amazing when we hear the great things that will happen as we will miss them next week. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen, if you can please be seated. Lord, we come to you in prayer and we pray for our nation. Lord, I pray that no matter what we thought, help us to unlearn what we need to unlearn and learn what we need to learn. And what we need to learn is we live in an evil, toxic, tension, twisted world that is so hungry for the only cure and they don't even know it. And his name is Jesus. Because Jesus' ways are gentle. They're kind. They're compassionate. They're loving. They're filled with joy, even in the midst of trial and disagreement. Jesus' ways bring hope, real hope. We don't need to experience the types of things that we experience. But Lord, you warned us. You said, in this world, you will have many troubles. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. So Lord, we do pray for protection for our former president. And we pray, God, that the gospel would be magnified in and through this. That even now you would touch his heart and allow him to express forgiveness and mercy like Christ does for all of us who don't deserve it. Do that, Lord. Let that be on the news. Please, Lord, magnify yourself in and through this because I know that troubles have treasures. Now, Lord, I pray for our congregation and all those who are in need here at Promise Church, both emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, relationally, Lord. We know that there's many, many needs as the prayer requests have come through even this week via email. Lord, we pray, God, that you would please turn beauty from ashes, make diamonds out of that pressure, Mop up the messes and bring miracles, Lord. Do what only you can do, Lord. We pray for our guests that are here today, Lord. Pray, God, that they would feel something here today from heaven. They would know that there's something amazing because you're here and you are amazing. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you came in a little late, just a couple housekeeping instructions because we don't want any FOMO in here, okay? If you're looking for a seat, there's a few more seats in our symphony room. You guys can get in there. There's a nice air conditioning room. There's a speaker in there. You'll hear every word we say. You'll see everything there from behind the glass if you're getting tired standing. Also, Brad, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's a stack of chairs in the zero to six room. You guys already got them. You're good. What I want to tell you is after this, this room will be flipped into a little banquet area. So what I'm going to need you to do is immediately after the service, um, don't pass go, don't collect $200, don't even go to jail, okay? Just immediately, if you can make your way to the vestibule, outside, and start forming a line into the hospitality room because the food will already be ready to be received. While that's happening and you're all in there, our team will flip this room and put a bunch of tables in here, and these chairs will be around tables and we'll be able to feed about 100 people in here, okay? The rest of you, 
There's some high top tables and stuff you can gather into the, the, um, the vestibule if you feel like. I know some of you don't like that, like, you know, tight feeling. It won't be tight. It'll be good. We've, we've done this before. So trust me, we'll be okay. okay. All right, Baptism Sunday. Who's excited? Is there anyone excited? <laughs> what is baptism? Right? I mean, we could ask that question. A lot of us come to the table with different things, and these things are called presuppositions, right? It's a fancy word, but it's an important word. You presuppose because of the life experiences that you've had and things that have kind of latched on to you, both in your, both in your upbringing, some of the traditions of your family, some of the things that you've witnessed around you, right? But my prayer is, when we look at baptism from a biblical view, and only a biblical view, and not my view, and not anyone else's view, I wonder if there might be something that we can learn today. So, what is baptism? Let's start from the beginning. What is the meaning of the word? If we're going to talk about baptism, we should probably do a little vocabulary, right? The word baptize means to dip, submerge, immerse, or to cover. And as it relates to a follower of Jesus, this is done in water, okay? Now, why water, right? Any of you take a shower lately? Raise your hand. Okay. It was clean water, right? We know that water cleans. Anybody drink from your tap at home, right? Water's purified. We know that water gives life and water is necessary. Now, all that to say this, the symbolism of water in baptism is very, very important. Did you know that the Bible speaks of baptism many times, even before Jesus came to earth? What does the Bible say about baptism? Who came up with the idea of baptism? Well, I want you to know that God came up with the idea of baptism. In the very first part of the Bible, in Leviticus chapter 6, there's a mentioning, and then 8, and all the way to, to chapter 12, which these are Moses' instructions that God has given them. Moses was instructed because he was about to install the very first priest, which happens to be his brother. His name is Aaron, and Aaron's sons. They come from the tribe of Levi. And God instructed Moses and Aaron and his sons and all the priests that come after them to baptize themselves so that they can come to God's holy and sacred work with a sense of awe and reverence. You follow me? This was passed down to all of the other Jewish priests who baptized themselves in clean water. Now, mind you, again, the word baptize means to dip, submerge, immerse, or to cover. In this case, it's water, Okay? Now, there's something very important that happened. God gave instructions to go into this place called either the temple, when they had this building that they built, or the tabernacle for 40 years that they've had before the actual temple was built. And God gave instructions to the priests to go into a certain part that was only to be entered in this special worship tent where God's glory dwelt. And these priests, which were called high priests, were given permission to go into this special place called the Holy of Holies where God's presence dwelt under the Ark of the Covenant to make, it's a special word, atonement for people's sins, okay? Now, what does atonement mean? This is not a word that we use at work or at home. When's the last time you told your kids, don't worry, I'll make atonement for your sins. You're forgiven. We don't do that at home. It just simply means a covering for sins. Now, mind you, a covering for sins, Okay, here's the sins. This is atonement. Take the atonement away, the sin is still there. A covering for sins because God despises sin. Now moving forward, I want you to know that baptism was basically a way of obeying the instructions that God gave before entering that sacred place to come with a sense of awe and reverence to make atonement or a covering for the sins of the people of Israel. Don't miss that. You're going to need that. Now, moving forward a little more, Jews practice baptism 
in water symbolizing an act of purification, or in other words, cleansing themselves before God. So not only the priests were doing this, the people were doing this. And they had to, and if anyone wanted to convert to Judaism, they had to partake in a baptismal service. And it was always done publicly, not privately. But there was nothing in the baptism water that would take away sin. And there was nothing in the atonement that really took away sin. There was a covering for the sin, but there was never a final full payment for the penalty of sin. And the Old Testament communicates the fact that hearts needed to be right before God. So all these little things that God commanded were the rototilling of the soils of the heart. And before Jesus was alive, God wanted his people to know that God was set apart and that he is holy, which means he's set apart and there's no one like him. And God does not sin, but we do. Now, what is sin? Sin is disobeying God. It is rebellion against God, his standards, his boundaries. And all of the things in the early part of the Bible were a foreshadowing of what was to come. Now, let's fast forward to Jesus. There was a man named John. They nicknamed him John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist. And he baptized people with water as well. But his baptism was to prepare the way for what was to come from all of these casting of foreshadows that happened before Jesus was actually born of the Virgin Mary and then began his ministry at 30 years old. So John the Baptist was baptizing people with this thing called the baptism of repentance. What does repentance mean? Repentance basically means a change of mind and purpose. And now this is found in the New Testament, which is the days of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the early church, and the, the foretelling of what's going to happen at the end of age. Okay? Now, this is what John said in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Check this out on the screen. It says, quote, I baptize you with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Something amazing was about to happen, and it points to where we're going today. You see, the baptism of all baptisms was about to take place. Remember, remember baptism, to go under, to, to dip, to submerge, to cover yourself in something. Now, this amazing moment that was about to happen is found in the person of Jesus. He offered the final baptism. Remember the word, again, means to submerge. Now, where did he submerge himself? The, great, the greatest baptism ever was about to be witnessed on the face of the earth, and that is the baptism of Jesus' death that offers the final, complete, not only covering for sins, but removal cleansing of all of our sins. And those who repent, trust, and put their faith in him will be cleansed and saved from their sins. And the Holy Spirit will dwell in that person. That's Romans 8, 8 through 11. The Holy Spirit's job is, participants, to lead you, to guide you, to give you wisdom, to make you feel bad about your sin. You ever feel bad about your sin? This is like the Flintstones when you got that little guy there. You probably shouldn't do that. Okay? Or Jiminy Cricket or Tom and Jerry, right? So much more. So much more. Infinitely more. Now, a warning to us all. Remember that when we read that John the Baptist said that Jesus would baptize also, not only with the Holy Spirit, which I just told you, to indwell somebody who's professed faith in Jesus, but with fire. Fire is a symbol in the word of God of punishment and judgment because of our sin if we don't believe and put our trust in Jesus, the only one who can make us clean and pure before a perfect God who is holy. And I wonder if you believe this today. This happens when one repents. Remember, a change of mind and thinking. You turn from your sin and you turn toward Jesus who paid the penalty for your sin when he took on the baptism of death. See, he did this because death is the wages for sin. 
Will you repent today if you've not already? Now, my question is, why do we baptize today? I mean, they did all this, and it's great, okay, we got the history piece. Why do we do it today? Well, let's fast forward a little more, and you're going to see this on the screen from Jesus' lips in Matthew 28, 18. You see the part there where he says in 19, therefore go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of age. So we baptize today because Jesus told us to. But notice that there's a certain person who can be baptized. Who can be baptized? Jesus said a disciple can be baptized. What is a disciple? A disciple is a teachable student that desires to learn about Jesus and obey his commands and his teachings and to follow him because they put their trust, their faith, and their belief in him for the cleansing of their sin and receiving the Holy Spirit. Now notice that Jesus said that they are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why would he say this? Well, first of all, let's consider the Father because God, our Father, is the supreme maker, creator of all things, things that are seen and unseen. He is the author of life and he provides eternal life. He is the most powerful entity in all the universe. He sees you. He knows you. He remembers you and he hears you. He knows how many tears you've cried and he knows how many times you've been anxious. Your father in heaven is in absolute control over every single thing that happens here on the face of the earth. Every breath you take, which is a gift from him, because he loves you. How about the Son? Why would we say we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Son? See, Jesus is the person of the invisible God, Colossians chapter 1. He holds all things together. He is the way, the truth, and the life, John chapter, who knows? 14 verse what? Good, 14, 6. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father and to him unless the Father draws him. Also, Jesus is the one who can make you right and pure before a perfect God. And his bloody death on the cross was the payment for our disgusting sin. And he alone can make us right with God. Now, why the Holy Spirit? See, the Holy Spirit is the one who caused you to believe in Jesus by making you, which Jesus said these words, not me and those crazy people that everyone thinks they're crazy, born again. Loaded word today. Those born againers. I tell you why they're called born again is because Jesus said that if you're not born twice and you're only born once, you will go to hell. You will not go to heaven. You need to be born of something that can sustain you forever. And that's by the Holy Spirit. Your flesh will count for 70 and 80 years, 90 if you've got a good doctor, 100, you've got good genes in your family, right? But the Spirit of God will last forever. And that's why Jesus said you need to be born from above. Because the spirit came from where? Not the earth, from above. So the Holy Spirit, again, he's your helper. He gives you wisdom. He convicts you of your sin, makes you feel bad. He's that still quiet voice in your head that says, keep following Jesus. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The most powerful entity in all the world. It's called the Trinity. The Trinity. Without the Trinity, nothing would ever exist. All that ever exists would never be able to be sustained or held together. Without the Trinity, there'd be no life and there'd be no purpose for life. There would be no eternal life and we would never be able to make God known and to know him. So when you're baptized today, think about that. Think about all that. That's why we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Feel that in your soul. So what is baptism? Well, I gotta tell you what it's not first because there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings and myths about baptism that have been passed down from human views and not biblical views. Let me tell you what it's not. Baptism does not save us from our sins. Baptism happens after someone has put their faith, trust, and belief in Jesus as their savior for the forgiveness of sins, being born again and receiving the Holy Spirit. 
This person desires to follow Jesus in his ways, his teachings, and his commands. And that it's why it's important to note, and I know that this hurts. It hurt me when I heard it, okay? Infant baptism does not save you. If you die and you're counting on your infant baptism, the word of God, even your Bible, your Bible, not my Bible, if it's a God-inspired Bible, and you know who I'm talking about, will tell you otherwise. We've been sold alive for many, 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 many years. Because the prince of this world, whose name is Satan, has got in the minds and hearts of people who wanted power and wanted to do things their own way. And they turned and they went a different way, and that's why Promise Church is a church that believes that we would only preach biblical truths because without the truth, we could never be set free. A person needs to decide this with God's help. And on their own, they feel this heartfelt acknowledgement that God has saved their soul. And by his grace and through faith, this person has been saved of their sins. And they put their faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Next, baptism will not make you perfect or sinless. Listen, we need a savior every breath and every minute we take. I needed one even earlier before we even started the service. I did something stupid and man, did I need a savior. Okay? We all know that. So if you think, I'll just get baptized when I get my life right. Good luck. We don't get our life right. We never do. But baptism says we do want to because of what he has done for us. Amen? Well, baptism doesn't make you perfect or sinless. We all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. Baptism is never a private ceremony. I told you guys that even when the priest did this, it was done in the great assembly, which is a congregational thing. It was never done behind closed doors. Now, can somebody do their own private thing? Yes, women after their menstrual cycle would baptize themselves so they can go back to temple and worship God with a sense of cleanliness, and they did it alone. But 99.9% .9 of the time, it was done publicly for everyone to enjoy. The Old Testament says that, so does the New. Biblical baptism should be done public, and that's why there's a hundred and something people here today. And it should be enjoyed by many witnesses because it could open up the eyes of faith to those who don't follow Jesus. Yet. And it could encourage those who do. Another myth is, baptism is for the mature believer right? That's not true. Baptism is the first sign of maturity, not the last. And if you know Jesus and you haven't been baptized, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I mean, that's foolish. This is like a man who's, or a woman who says, I just got married, but I'm not going to wear the wedding ring until we get along a little better. Ain't happening, I'll tell you that. The ring is a public reminder of a wholehearted promise. The baptism is a public reminder of a wholehearted promise. I promise to follow Jesus. Now, what is baptism? I told you what it's not. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision to follow Jesus that was prompted by the Holy Spirit. No one can do this on their own. This person then decides wholeheartedly to make a public display of their faith, trust, and belief in Jesus and desire to follow him, no matter how hard it gets. Baptism is like the wedding ring of a true Christian. Baptism was so important that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Baptism and communion are two things that were commanded from the scriptures so that our faith can be sight. You catch that? So if you were wondering, God, if you would just show me something, I can't see you, I can't hear you, you never, like, you know, touch me and feel me, and like, you know, I'm intimate with my husband or wife or my kids or my friends, but there's nothing there, God. He knew. He knew. Partake of communion, because all five of your senses will be touched on that. Partake of baptism, because all five of your senses will be partaken in that, or affected, I should say. Now let's fast forward to Romans chapter 6. I usually tell you to grab a Bible, but man, by the time we get Bibles in your hands today, 
it'll be too late and you guys are going to be yelling at me because we went too long. So we're not doing that. Romans chapter 6. If you have a Bible, turn to Romans 6. 3 through 7. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ, Jesus, in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Verse 5. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Why? For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And this brings us to where we are right now. The baptism of a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah, make some noise. When we baptize our beloved today, we will put them underwater, symbolizing that they have been buried with Christ. Their sins, their uncleanliness to God, their all of their impurifications, their guilt, their shame, their sorrow. Buried with Christ. That's what Romans 6 says. Their old way of thinking, their old desires, buried with Christ. For we died and we were buried with Christ. But then, but then, they come out of the water. When they come out of the water, it symbolizes that they've been raised with Christ. If this person has been raised with Christ, like Christ, you've been raised from the dead so that you can come back to life even after your last breath on earth. That's what you're publicly displaying to everybody here. Coming out of the water symbolizes new life, eternal life in Christ, cleansed, the celebration of salvation, the commitment of being changed from the inside out. They are raised to walk in the newness of life. And this can only happen if you're buried with Christ. You gotta be buried with Christ before you're raised to the newness of life. When one has life in Christ, their life now looks like the life of Jesus. He loves the unlovable. He forgave the unforgivable. He trusted his father. His way is peace. He went after lost people. He spoke to those who no one wanted to speak to. He loved his father because he knew his father loved him. And he was the word who became flesh. A person who has been raised to walk in a newness of life in Christ will stay close to what we call the six. We've got it on our wall on a banner there. I'm going to put it on the screen so you can see it in front of you. This is really near and dear to us. This is what I want to challenge the participants to ponder on today. Those are the things that we need to keep doing after this day and every day, just like the rest that are here who are doing it now. Many of you. Get in the word. Keep prayer going. Stay connected to God's people because we know bad company corrupts good character. Does that mean don't go out to people that don't believe the things you do? No. Embrace them. Love them. Show them there's something different about you. Don't judge them. Love them. Remember, don't judge. Love first. Remember that. We have to connect with people. Next, we got to tell others about Jesus. He's better than a Portillo's beef or a Lou Malmati's pizza, okay? So you should tell people about that, Jesus, before that. Find ways to serve others and make disciples who multiply themselves. That's the six. So they continue in their discipleship by these things. We will now baptize eight people. You will hear their amazing 
life transforming stories. You're going to hear things that you just can't make up. Only God can do these things. And you're going to see people's faith become sight right before all of us here. And I hope and pray that your faith will become sight. And I pray that there'd be a, a sense of heaven that touches all of Promise Church here today.